So last week, I trust, because I wasn't here, but that Andrew addressed a, a, the a question before this, which was, does Christ's death mean all our sins can be forgiven? And from the scriptures, I trust he showed that Christ's death purchases our forgiveness, and more than that, God imputes or credits to us his righteousness and promises that we will share in his resurrection from the dead. And this is not on the basis of works, it's on the basis of faith. And so this week, we're kind of addressing then another question that's quite closely related to that, which is what else does Christ's death redeem, right? And here, I think it's helpful, as if you, if you listen to me do a few of these, I always go back to Genesis. It seems a, a habit. Because in Genesis 1.26, um, just as God had created Adam and Eve, right, he then uh, declares, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Right? So when God created mankind, mankind was given dominion over all of the creatures that God had just created. And even the earth itself, they were given dominion over all of this. Right? So then we fast forward to Genesis chapter 3. And we've got the serpent who deceives Eve. And Adam and Eve fall into sin. So each, the serpent, Eve, and Adam receive a curse as a result, as a, a consequence for their actions in that fall. Yet each curse doesn't only apply to that individual, right? In the case of Satan, his curse is the first hint of the redemption of, of all of mankind, or at least of God's chosen people within mankind. And in Adam's case, we read, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So in this case we see that Adam's curse extends beyond Adam to the whole of creation, right? Even to the earth, because everything under Adam's dominion was cursed. And why does this matter? Well, when we kind of logically consider God's redemption plan and he's going to reverse this curse, well, it's reasonable for us to expect then that the reversing of this curse will not extend beyond just humanity to everything else that was cursed for mankind's sake. So if we consider what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 19, he says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to fut futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit. We groan inwardly as we, w eagerly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Right? So the, while the redemption of mankind is one of the central themes of scripture, we see hints of the redemption not only of mankind, but of the whole of creation too. And just as our perishable bodies must put on the imperishable, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, so we also see in Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. And he who is seated on the throne says, behold, I am making all things new. So when we survey the whole of the Bible, we see that God's redemption plan includes the redemption and the resurrection of all of mankind who believe in the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus, but we also see how God's redemption plan includes the restoring of the rest of his creation. The very good creation of Genesis 1 will finally be restored, and as it says in Revelation 21 verse 3, the dwelling place of God then will be with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And this is our hope, and this is what we look forward to. So at this point, then, I invite you to stand and join with me. I'll read the question at the top there, and I invite you to join with me in reading the answer. So what else does Christ's death redeem? Christ's death is the beginning of the redemption and renewal of every part of fallen creation, as he powerfully directs all things for his own glory and creation's good. I'll just take a moment here to pray Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace that you have revealed throughout the whole of history. In light of mankind's rebellion, we see, Lord, more fully and more truly your grace, your love revealed through your Son. We thank you how you have loved us through your Son. And yet, Lord, we thank you that we have a hope not just in this life, in this world now, 
but that our hope is looking forward to when you make all things new, to when you bring forth a new heaven and a new earth, when our dwelling place is in your midst, in your presence. So Lord, help us not to live for the things that we see now. Help us not to live by sight, but by faith, faith in the hope that you have presented to us through your word. Lord, strengthen us to, to hope in these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so at the